chart y'all might want to reference as we as we talk about we're going to be talking about a lot of a lot of gates around Jerusalem as, as Nehemiah prepares to rebuild the wall and I said well I'll I'll kind of print out and give you guys an idea of, of kind of what the shape of the wall was and what the uh, where the gates were that are being talked about we won't go into all those gates in great detail tonight but in the next next week probably we'll we'll discuss some of those and so just kind of a visual aid and then on the back side, the front side's got that yellow and red. And if you flip on the back side, uh, you'll see this, you'll see this uh, kind of larger, larger shape on the left side. And inside that, you see that darker black line. Well, the the outside line, the lighter line, would would have been the original walls of Jerusalem. And when when Ezra and and Nehemiah and all of them came back in, and they began to rebuild the temple and rebuild the walls. That darker line would be the section that Nehemiah rebuilt. So you can see that Jerusalem was not really in its former glory. It, it definitely was was much different. And so it had, it, it, it had been, been said that they would go back into the land, and they did, and that they would rebuild the temple, and they did. The temple was rebuilt, and uh, the people were there, but it was not nearly as grand as what, as what it was before. And so anyway, uh, the picture on your right there that's in color, uh, that, that's just kind of a 3D render of what it may have looked like. And so as we talk about these walls and we talk about this area, uh, this might give you a little bit of an idea of, of, of what we're talking about and what it looks like. So just a little visual aid there for you. But let's pray, and then we will jump into Nehemiah chapter 2. Father God, we come to you, and I thank you for these words, and I pray that as we see the things that Nehemiah is going through and we see how you're working, dear Lord, I pray that something in this story and your words would apply to our life, whatever we may be going through, whatever's going on in our life. And I pray that you help us to be focused, help me to be focused tonight, dear Lord, that I can do a good job to present your word, to, to teach it and to preach it. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would would get some, bring some application to our mind and to our heart. And, and that we can grow in you in some way as we try to understand your word better. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we left off last week. Nehemiah had received word uh, that Jerusalem was in bad shape. Uh, people had started to go back in. The temple had been rebuilt, but the walls were still not built. And so the city didn't really have any protection. They needed, they needed those walls so more people could... Uh, continue to go back to the city, and they would be safe as they went back there. And at the end of Nehemiah 1, we were given a little detail uh, that Nehemiah was the cupbearer. Now, Nehemiah served under King Artaxerxes, who was the son of Xerxes that we are reading about in the book of Esther. So these events took place a few years after that. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. During the month of Nisan... In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now, just a brief brief thing before we continue. You, you may remember from when we read Nehemiah chapter 1, it talked about the month of Chislev in the 20th year. And then when we get over to Nehemiah chapter 2, it talks about the month of Nisan in the 20th year. Now, Chislev would be around November and December. But when we read about Nissan, that's talking about March or April. So that gives us a time frame. However, I had to I had to think for just a second, and you guys may not have had that problem, but I was like, wait, if we were in the 20th year and it was November and December, shouldn't the 21st year be March and April since we're in March and April? But, but I was thinking in years. I wasn't thinking in years of the king's reign. And so this is in the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign. So let's say, for instance, I don't know, but we'll just make a, pick a date. Let's say, for instance, his reign started in July. That his 20, The 20th year of his reign started in July. So you could still have November and December in the 20th year of his reign, and you could still have March and April because it wouldn't start the 21st year until July. So I was thinking, man, there's a discrepancy there. How could we go back in time? But we didn't go back in time. He wasn't talking about a specific year. Instead, he was talking about the reign of King Artaxerxes. And so we're still in the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign, but now we've progressed from November or December 
to March, April in that time frame. And it says here that uh, he was, uh, when wine was set before him, uh, as the cupbearer, Nehemiah would have been the one who would have served the king his drink. He would have brought his wine to him. He would have brought his cup to him. And he took the wine to the king, and it said uh, in the end of verse 1 there, I had never been sad in his presence. And so Nehemiah was definitely sad over the news he got. He'd been praying and he had been fasting about the sin of the people and the condition of Jerusalem. And we saw that in chapter 1. But here he goes before the king and he is sad. And the king notices this in verse 2. So the king said to me, Why are you sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but depression. I was overwhelmed with fear. And so the king could see that there was something about Nehemiah that wasn't right. Now, uh, some of your translations may say sorrow of heart or something along those lines. That's probably more literal if your translation says his, his, his heart was sad, a saddened heart or a sorrowed heart. Uh, but, but we may use the word depression, and that may be a fitting word too because, man, when we feel down about something, we do kind of get depressed in a sense. And the king could see that. Nehemiah could not hide it. And because the king noticed that, Nehemiah was afraid. Now, that's because it wasn't good to go before the king and be sad. You were not supposed to go before the king in times when you were fasting and wearing sackcloth and, and times of sadness. We actually see a good example of that in Esther chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. We'll get to this in a few weeks. But speaking of Mordecai in Esther chapter 4, it says, When Mordecai learned that all, all that had occurred, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went into the middle of the city and cried loudly and bitterly. He only went as far as the king's gate since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. And so we'll talk more about what Mordecai was upset about there. But, but the idea that, look, when you were in this time of fasting or mourning or sadness, it was the law that you didn't go before the king. And even Jesus tells us in the New Testament that when we are uh, fasting, that we don't we don't want, we don't want to look bad. We don't want people. We don't want it to be obvious. Now, in the case of Nehemiah, he wasn't trying to get people's attention. When Jesus spoke of that in Matthew six, he said, "Look, some people when they fast, they try to look disheveled, so everybody will say, oh, are you okay?' And then they can say, "Oh, it's, I'm okay. I'm just fasting.'" Well, that's not what Nehemiah was doing. He wasn't trying to get any pity from the king. He simply was just. He was so saddened that he could not hide it. And the same is true for us. There are some days where we may try to fake it, but when, if we're really sad, then we can't hide it. And neither could Nehemiah, and he was afraid. But Nehemiah replied, and, and uh, verse 3, I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Now, maybe Nehemiah said that as a way just to just to uh, appease the king, uh, to, to, to try to win the favor of the king because of his sadness. Maybe he said that as a way to say, hey, look, I still support you, king. There's nothing against you. I don't, there's no problems here. And so he says, may the king live forever. And then he explains to the king what's going on. He says, why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruin and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now the king says, What's going on? I see you're sad. And Nehemiah, he shares it with him. Now, there's, there's a good, some good application there in our life because there may be times that people can see that there's something going on or people ask us, hey, what's going on? Is there something you need to talk about? And we say, oh, I'm fine, when really we're not. But maybe we just need to say, hey, here's what's going on. That's what Nehemiah did. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I would imagine that probably wouldn't have been something that would have been would have been something that you should have done. Go before the king as a king's servant and start telling the king your problem. But yet, Nehemiah did that. And, and perhaps when people ask us, hey, what's going on? Then maybe we need to tell them what's going on if we're sad or if we're going through something. And we may be surprised that their response may be something that will help us get through it. And so Nehemiah says, look, the land I'm from, where my ancestors are buried, it is, it is destroyed. The walls, the gates, and I am just devastated because of, because of the situation there. 
in verse 4. Then the king asked me, What is your request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah and to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I may rebuild it. The king, with the queen, seated beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you return? So I gave him a definitive time, and it pleased the king to send me. So isn't this an interesting response of the king here? He says, all right, well, what can I do? What is your request? What do you need? How can I help you? And that's a good response for us, too. If, if we see somebody who's saddened, then maybe we need to be the one that asks, hey, what do you need? How can I help you? What's going on? If they tell us that something's going on, maybe we need to say, what can I do to help you? And help him in some way. And that's exactly what the king did. Now, maybe the king did this with all of his servants. I don't know. But I would venture to say probably not. But Nehemiah had the boldness to say, here's what's going on, king. And the king said, okay, so what can we do about it? And it said Nehemiah prayed. And he had already prayed in the first chapter. We saw that he prayed and he fasted and he called out to God and he acknowledged his sin. But even right here in the moment, when the king said, he might have said a silent prayer, he might have said a quick prayer, but he said, okay, God, here we go. You're going to have to help me. I don't know what he said, but he prayed to God in some way, and then he made his request. He says, if it pleases the king, let me go back to Judah. Let me go back to Jerusalem specifically and be able to rebuild these walls. And the king said, okay, how long will you be gone for? You know, you never know. It might, it might seem against all odds. Nehemiah could have said, oh no, I can't tell the king anything. Who am I to bring my request before the king? I'm a servant. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. But against all odds, Nehemiah just opened up. And, and maybe against all odds, the king said, okay, what do you need? I'll let you go. How long do you need to be gone for? And we may be surprised too that if there are things that we need, help that we need, support that we need, we may be surprised that if we are just honest with people and say, look, here's my struggle, here's my need, will you help me? We may be surprised at what people around us may say. We may be surprised that the boss at our job, if we say, man, I need to time off, I got something going on, he'll never give it to him. We'll be surprised if we say, look, I need a week off. I need two weeks off. You just never know when you ask somebody what their response may be. And so be like Nehemiah and pray about it. And don't be afraid. Don't go out trying to, trying to get people's pity by telling them your problems. But, but there may be times that you genuinely just need to confide in folks. And when they want to help you and they ask you about it, do like Nehemiah. And God may open the door for you just like he opened it for Nehemiah. And so he said, look, king said, go ahead. Just tell me when you're going to be back. And so Nehemiah was ready to head on his, on his path. Verse 7. I also said to the king, if it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress, the city wall, and the home where I live. The king granted my request, for I was graciously strengthened by my God. So isn't this something? So the king's already said, all right, go ahead. Take all the time you need. And Nehemiah said, can I ask something else of the king? I'm going to be going through all these different places. Can I have letters from the king to let people know, that, to, to, be, to show me favor on my journey? There's going to be materials I need. Can I get some letters to these certain people that can help provide me with the materials uh, that I need to accomplish my goal? And the king granted his request. He was bold enough to ask, and the king granted his request. Now, when we talk about the kings of this era, from the, from the end of the Babylonian exile all the way up to this point we are, the kings that we see in Scripture, Darius and Cyrus and Xerxes and Artaxerxes, these kings all show favor to the people of God. They don't, they don't seem like that they, that they hate the Jews in any way, but, but instead they give the decree for them to go back to the land. And when they go back to the land, here our Xerxes says, I'm going to give you the time and the materials to do what you need to rebuild your land. And so there certainly wasn't really any hostility between the rulers of the day 
and, and the Jewish people. Now, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that all of these kings were necessarily religious or, or that they, they followed or believed the things that God's children did, but at the very least, they were not, they were not enemies of them, but they helped them. And, uh, and this is a good example of, of, of how that help has continued to occur throughout, throughout the years after uh, the exile as the people begin to return to Jerusalem. Verse 9, I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. Now, isn't that something? Not only did the king give him the time off, first he listened to his problem. He offered to help with his problem. He gave him the time off. He said, whatever resources you need, you got. And he sent men with him. He sent the infantry and the cavalry with him. And so, man, this king was really supportive of Nehemiah. Now, certainly God had a, had a hand in this. I mean, maybe the king was a nice guy, but we can't, we can't uh, fail to acknowledge that God had to have played some part in this and Nehemiah gaining the favor of the king. And this story is not so different than what we've talked about in Esther in that way, that God's people have continued to gain favor uh, all throughout Scripture. And Nehemiah is just one more example of that. And then in verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to seek the well-being of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. So here we are introduced to the enemies of the story. Uh, Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite. Now we don't really hear much about Horonite in the scripture and uh, there was a place called Beth Horon and it was right on the border of where Israel was. You can read about that in Joshua chapter 16. And then Tobiah the Ammonite. We are for, a little more familiar with the Ammonites. Uh, they descended from, from Lot, Abraham's uh, nephew Lot, when they split off. Uh, Lot went one way and Abraham went one way and Lot's sons, Moab and Ammon, became the Moabites and the Ammonites. And they, they were, they were uh, to the uh, east of, of where the land of Israel was. And specifically, when they went into the, the promised land, when Joshua was leading them in, God specifically said, don't take the land of the Moabites or the Ammonites. Now, I don't know what the reason for that was. It, it may say in Scripture, I'm not sure, but, but I, would, I would guess that maybe it was because these were descendants uh, of, 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 of Lot that was a cousin of, of Abraham. But God had given them specific instructions. However, by the time we get uh, later in Scripture in the book of Amos, he tells us that the Ammonites were evil people, that they would rip open the stomachs of, of pregnant women. And so they were, they were very evil people, and eventually they were overtaken uh, by the Israelites. And that's, that's probably why these two, two guys here didn't like the Israelites because uh, uh, the Israelites obviously had been in the land for years and I would imagine that the tension had probably built for a long time. And so here we are introduced to these enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah. They were dis very displeased that Nehemiah had come back in and he had the support that he had. Nehemiah could never have done this on his own. He could have made the journey. Uh, of course, God could have provided in any way but he's, he decided to provide through the king. And so Nehemiah had great support, and uh, that was not great news for these people who, who hated God's people, who hated the Jewish people. Verse 11, After I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there for three days, excuse me, and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but further down it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned down. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. 
I told him how the gracious hand of God had been on me and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. And they were encouraged to do this good work. So Nehemiah was there. He had made it to Jerusalem with the support that he needed. And he hadn't really told anybody what his plan was, what God had put on his heart, what he was going to do. And so he took a handful of folks at night and he went out to inspect the walls. He went through all these different gates, some of which you're going, or all of which I suppose you're going to see on you, on your printout there. And he, he began to make his way around. He began to survey. He began to look at the damage to see what they were going to need to do. And the damage was great. But he made his way back and he gathered everybody up and he said, here's what we're going to do. We're fixing to rebuild this wall. And the people were encouraged. The people were encouraged. Nehemiah said, look, this is what God has, has, has called me to do. We've got the support of the king. We are about to start this project. And, and this, this, this would have been a great thing. You can imagine uh, what the people must have felt like. I mean, they all probably felt like Nehemiah when they came back in. I mean, they saw the, they saw the, the rubble. They saw the, the ruin. They saw the condition. And, and no doubt many of them were saddened too. And here comes somebody who says, all right, let's do it. They had a leader. They had the resources, and they were ready to do the work that God had called them to do, and they were about to begin the project of rebuilding the wall. In verse 19, When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, What is this you're doing? Are you going to rebel against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of heaven is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building. But you have no share, right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. And so everybody was excited, but the enemies were there. It was not going to be an easy task. But even still, Nehemiah said, Nope, I know my God is with me, and you are not going to stop this plan that God has put into place. Now, there's a lot of good things perhaps we can see from this story. Maybe one thing we, can, we need to remember is it, is it is good and important for us to ask for help. It is okay for us to say, I'm struggling in this way. It is okay for us to make requests to people that we love and say, look, here's what's going on in my life. Here's why I'm sad. Here's why I'm, I'm upset. It's all right to have those conversations. And more importantly, it's all right to have those conversations with God. We may sometimes not be as bold toward God as we should be. We may say, oh, God doesn't care about this, or God's hearing about this, or, or, or God's tired of hearing about this, or man, I've sinned too much. God doesn't want to hear from me. God doesn't want to listen to me. And we may fail to bring our request to God, but we must never do that. That's the enemy that doesn't want us to bring our request to God. We need to pray to God, especially when we are in sin. That's exactly what Nehemiah did in chapter 1. He knew that he and the people were in sin, and he boldly went before the Lord. He went before the king. He knew that he wasn't supposed to speak before, speak before the king, but he boldly went before the king. And what happened? God heard his prayer. The king heard his request. And both God and the king, God working through the king, I believe, helped strengthen and encourage and give Nehemiah what he needed to, to complete the task at hand. Now, God will do the same for us. I don't know what your task at hand is, and you may not either. Maybe you don't have one right now. I suspect you probably do. But, but maybe you'll have one in the future. And God may call you to something that breaks your heart. And you say, okay, God, what can I do about this? That's what Nehemiah did. And God said, all right, here's what you can do. You can get on over there. I'm going to send you to rebuild the walls. And so, so whatever you have called to do, whatever your task is, then be ready to do it and ask God to help you to know what to do. And he will, he will prepare you and provide for you what you need to be able to accomplish that task. And we also need to remember that as we seek to accomplish our task, that it is not going to be easy. It seems like in every story you read, whether it's in the scripture or whether it's a book or whether it's a TV show or a movie, there's always a bad guy. There's always a roadblock. And so everything that Nehemiah had going for him, here these two guys come, or three guys that mentions here at the end of, of the passage, here they come and they are a, a thorn in his side throughout this process. 
but yet he says, I'm not going to back down. Now, I don't know what tasks are ahead of you. I don't know what, what God may put on your heart or what God may call you to do, but know that it won't be easy. Don't, don't be discouraged. That's, that's, it's easy to get excited about something like these, like these guys wanting to rebuild the wall, right? They hear that Nehemiah's there. He says, here's what we're going to do. We got the stuff. Let's do it. They were encouraged. They're like, yeah, let's build a wall. And it's easy to get encouraged when you hear about something new and you get excited about it, some new something that's going on, maybe at church or at work. And man, one bad thing happens or somebody says something negative or does something negative or there's a roadblock that kind of kind of throws a wrinkle in things. And that, that really just kind of takes the wind out of your sails. It kind of discourages you. And, and a lot of time... It discourages enough that we just we just quit the project. We quit what we're working on. We quit what we need to do. But we cannot be like that. Because at the facing opposition that they that they see here and later on as we go through the book, they could have just said, Oh, this is gonna be too too tough. You know what? We're not gonna do this. They could have just tucked tail and run. But they didn't do that. They stayed and they trusted God and they did what God wanted to do through them. And he used them. And that's what God wants to do for us. So let your request be made known to God. Seek God. Listen to God. Trust God. And know that wherever you go, whatever he calls you to, he will provide you with what you need, and he will help you overcome your enemies if you trust him. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you and thank you for these good words, and I pray that we'd follow the example of Nehemiah because, well, really, God, our life's not so different than his. And so I pray that, one, we would seek you, and that we would, dear Lord, just bring our sins before you in the same way that, that Nehemiah did. And God, let us, let us be faithful to seek help when we need it from those around us. And God, help us to be able to give good help to those who come to us who need it. Let us be open and loving and caring and, and supportive and give us the words to say and, and the ideas of what we need to do maybe to help, help each other, dear Lord. And God, whatever, Whatever enemies we face along our journey, I pray that you help us to remain encouraged because it's easy to get discouraged. But I pray that in our discouragement and our sadness that you'll lift us up, that you'll turn our sadness into joy, dear Lord. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.